Hey guys, it's Taku. Welcome back to my channel. I hope you're all doing well. Today, we are sitting down and reading Naoko Takeuchi's Sailor Moon. It's the great classic Sailor Moon. Um, these are the Eternal Editions that Kodansha put out. They're these incredibly large deluxe edition manga. Uh, new translation, not new color necessarily. I think the color spreads are just the cover that's the new one, but there's some more like colored um, panels in here. And I've had this for so long and I've tried to read it um, repeatedly. I just can't seem to get through it. But I'm in a Sailor Moon kick right now. You will see future videos hopefully coming where I'm definitely in the Sailor Moon mood. And I decided, you know, why not? Why not pick this up and just see how far I can get through it? I'm really excited to see uh, how the original manga itself holds up. I know that there's already some uh, problematic things about it, but there are also some praises to be given to the original source. Enough rambling. I'm going to dive into chapter one of Sailor Moon and uh, maybe report back actually after the first couple chapters. So see you in a bit. All right, guys, I'm back. I have read, actually, um, I kind of was plowing through it. I've read like half of this uh, volume already. What can I say about Sailor Moon so far? Uh, the first chapter is uh, introduces us to Sailor Moon. She's definitely the wacky weirdo uh, young teenage girl that she is in all of the franchises. I think that's one thing that's consistent across all of them is that she's kind of an enthusiastic fool <laughs> in a way, young at heart course she's a sweetheart maybe it's just my memory but i don't remember luna's language in the manga she just translates kind of as a different cat <laughs> than she does in the anime even crystal i think maybe it's just a matter of like hearing luna talk versus you know reading the cat's lines but i feel like luna is actually like one of the parts that feels the most different it's 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 the same i think the design is you know slightly different in parts again i think in the manga there are there are pages where um, they omit Luna's nose. So maybe that's it. Maybe it's just like a visual distinction. So she just has like the signature cat eyes and then the little smile sometimes. And I think just not seeing, you know, a full on facial features. I mean, when you take out part of the face, it's hard to like make out expressions and stuff. But again, Takeuchi does a really good job at conveying other ways of expression, like through altering the backgrounds. There's lots of embroidered edges and frilly things. I'm trying to remember what it's called, like doily type of um, alterations to backgrounds. Very iconic. I see where both Crystal and the anime and the entire franchise, I see where it gets that aesthetic. Another thing I can say is that Usagi is really funny. I remember her being more annoying, I guess, in the TV show. Like, I remember her being funny depending on how the actress portrayed her, and then I got into watching uh, Stephanie Shea's performance. Love Stephanie Shea's. I, it's my favorite, actually. But I will say that Stephanie Shea's performance of Sailor Moon at the beginning is a little less funny than I remember her coming across as. And so when I read this though, she's hilarious. I think she's like such a goof. There are so many like little comic moments in this where she's just ruffling her hair. Um, and it's, just, it's funny. I, th I think she's funny. It's kind of a, it's like a doggish character to her. And it parallels really well when she meets, you know, Ami and Rei, which are the next two guardians. Ami is uh, pretty much like one for one in this. In fact, I remember watching the original series and I, don't, I didn't like Ami that much. Sorry. After watching the new Viz dub though, I love Ami. I think she's actually one of my favorite characters in the entire franchise. You just, maybe it's just being an academic, being a, being a scholar myself. It's just, it's tough. School's tough sometimes. And you do have to end up sacrificing a lot of time in your life for, you know, studies and exchanging that for friends. And so I, I see where Sailor Mercury, intelligence, water, I see where all of her story comes from. And again, the original source does a really good job at keeping pace with her character. It's very quick. Uh, Usagi introduces herself without, you know, a moment's hesitation, but she also has her sinister side where she's just like, oh, I see this girl and she's actually really cute and she's not like what the rumors say, uh, but also I can potentially use Ami to uh, increase my own grades and make me a, a super genius. So it's very, very Usagi uh, being silly. And I, I like it. I think it's uh, really cute. And then also I realized that it feels even faster than it normally does when you take out all the transformation sequences, which we all know that the transformations are what make Sailor Moon, Sailor Moon. So when you take those out and they're very abridged, you know, like two panels and then don't, we're already there. 
uh, it, it cuts down on a lot of maybe the iconography, but it speeds up the plot. So everything's really streamlined and it just feels like I'm kind of motorboating through the plot of Sailor Moon. Real quick, Ray. I didn't even talk about Ray. Uh, I didn't realize how associated Ray was kind of with omens and the crow and the shrine until uh, reading this, I think. I think the crows, she even has names for them. I don't remember them in Crystal. They were probably there because Crystal's pretty faithful, but I just don't remember them at all. I see like the weird, the weirdo, you know, the stereotypical, uh, like kind of dark person. I, I, I see now a little bit more where it comes from. And then I especially understand when the shrines, like patrons come up and they kind of, they, they in a sense curse the shrine itself after finding out, you know, that there's a bus that runs by the shrine where kids are disappearing. And so when some of the parents are blaming it on the shrine or they're skeptical about it, I see why that's insulting. I see why that distances you from other people. So I think the motives for the girls joining Sailor Moon's troop uh, are much more, again, streamlined in the manga. Of course, this is speeding past all the music, the openings, the transformation sequences, um, even the, the uh, extravagancies of combat. And instead it's just like a one panel, one and done. I got carried away and I almost forgot to mention that um, Tuxedo Mask's character in this, I already see why people kind of don't like him. I, in the anime, he comes off as, you know, this really charming suave guy. And that's the effect that the manga is trying to take. But there was a specific scene where uh, Tuxedo Mask swoops in and like lifts Sailor Moon up so that she can kick the bad guy in the face. I just thought it was unnecessary. I just, I don't see how that's very helpful. <laughs> Even in combat, like Sailor Moon could have just kicked them. I don't, I don't see why you needed to like, literally like touch her and like lift her up to do that. I'm gonna keep watching and see if that is something that continues because if it does, I will understand wholeheartedly why he's not problematic necessarily, but just unnecessary in the plot. So uh, I'll keep going. All right, I wanted to come on here and say that I've read um, a couple more chapters in the first volume here. The reason I'm coming on here instead of at the very end is because I'm already also noticing some more differences, um, particularly with the reveal and introduction of Sailor Jupiter. I don't remember this taking place the way that it did at all in the anime Crystal or the original. Again, I it's been a while since I've seen Crystal, so it could be different. And But I know it's definitely different from the original series. And basically there is kind of this ghost bride that's kind of like the new, I don't know, evil witch type character that gets taken in by one of the four knights, which are like the current bad guys before Queen Beryl. And this ghost bride pretty much takes control of uh, Motoki who runs the game shop or the arcade. And uh, he tries to get his hands on Makoto, um, AKA Sailor Jupiter. And I just don't remember this part taking place where Sailor Moon uses her transformation pen and turns into basically a man, uh, turns into a guy in a suit so that he can get up close to the Ghost Bride and then transforms back into Sailor Moon. And again, I could totally be wrong and maybe this is in Crystal and I just sound crazy, but I think that would be uh, an interesting thing to adapt now these days. I'm looking forward to actually like rewatching the anime now, uh, which I kind of had plans to do. I just thought that was an interesting observation. And then also uh, we're finally getting a call because we find out that Sailor Jupiter, AKA Makoto left her previous high school or middle school, sorry, they're young, left her previous middle school because it was a boy that broke her heart um, and she moved to the Juban area. But she mentions like more importantly, there was something else calling her. There was, there was something else. And so she followed the wind and yes, what was calling her was her destiny, her duty as a sailor guardian to protect the princess. And I, I really liked how that was transitioned in. Um, if that made its way into Crystal, I applaud them because I think that's a really good scene because it advances the plot a lot further, but then it also kind of reminds us of the purpose of this beginning is it shapes their characters, but then we're also trying to tug at this theme of destiny because I feel like that's one of the things when people watch or read Sailor Moon, um, they often miss the case that um, even the, the corniest themes or seem really coincidental. And it's because it's trying to tell the story of fate, specifically a round table story of fate, where the same themes and the same scenarios come up again and again and again. And it's about the way that these characters all fall into each other's lives repeatedly, because that is their destiny. On an entirely unrelated note though, um, Tuxedo Mask uh, coming up to Usagi's window <laughs> as she slept, that was a bit weird. But um, I'm now going to finish this up and then I will conclude with some thoughts. I hope this video is not too long.
All right, guys, a few hours have passed and I have finally completed the Sailor Moon manga and we finally get developments about the Dark Kingdom, which is the antagonistic force with Queen Beryl and then the four heavenly kings. And I, I like the way that it's actually handled in this a lot. I think that it's really um, scarring in a way to see like the four kings. So like it happened with um, the first one, I'm, I'm blanking on names, but um, it happened then with the second one, which I think is Nephrite. And they literally will like burn up. Sailor Mars using her flames power. And it, I mean, they're like, they keep the bodies preserved if they can. So um, like tucked away kind of in like the bottom corner of the page, we see kind of like a burnt head with like hair still attached. So I thought that was a little scarring. Definitely something that I don't think made its way into the cut of the anime. Maybe it did. Again, I could be wrong. But then we are also seeing how Queen Beryl is in fact using her um, manipulative powers to serve her ruler, which is Queen Metalia. But then also she wants to kind of usurp Metalia herself and become sort of this ruler of the galaxy and that really sets apart Beryl now we like identify with her more as an antagonist and kind of understand what she wants uh, from things and then also I didn't talk about this at all but the Dark Kingdom itself actually is like in a castle and I really like that I think the original anime they took the direction of it kind of being more of like this weird alien cave type thing and I, I mean they're rulers of a kingdom and I like the the more polished and uh, kind of classical look of the you know the the marble castle and the roman columns i just I, it suits them a lot nicer there's a lot more prestige that comes with it but then also i feel like they're actually more evil this way they feel like actual rulers of this you know dark kingdom that are kind of conniving to essentially take down the sailor scouts and then also amass this great power and rule uh, rule the universe from here. But that is the plot of the first volume here. At the very end, we get the iconic and legendary appearance of Sailor V, who, you know, sort of appears from the sky. And it's just really great. I'm definitely looking forward to reading more of this. I've got the other two volumes again. Thank you guys so much for following along. I've enjoyed the manga so much. And if you've got any comments, uh, let me know. And so, till next time.